Hello everyone and welcome to a very special start of a series of episodes of the NBA Show Reviews. This is James Cork and with me I have Norman Sanso. Hey James. And awesome brony reviewer extraordinaire Silver Quill. In my next video, I will offend Canada. <laughs> <laughs> oh my. Live in no country unoffended. That's right. I will. I am an international incident. <laughs> I, w I will be happy if you offend Spain, but be careful. We might invade you, <laughs> and, and then and then we'll run away. <laughs> I'm, I'm putting out the plea in the video. Please don't invade America. That's where I keep my socks. <laughs> <laughs> and in this new video series of reviews, we're going to be reviewing the MLP comics. Now, because we have the dreadful summer drought and we don't have any new episodes to come until God knows when. Will it be 2015? Will it be the end of 2014? Will it be next year or will it be before Valve releases Half-Life Episode 3? We don't know. We really don't know. So until then, we're going to take a look at the IDW published comics, which, if I remind everyone, you can purchase on the Comixology website or app for your Android and iPod devices. And I highly recommend you guys to get those or get an account on Comixology, because even if you cannot pay the prices for the comics, which are very affordable, by the way, they always have offers and they always have promotions where they lower the price of the comics or they uh, give comics for free. Also, take into account, we are most likely going to delve into spoilers. So if you haven't read the comics, stop listening to the review, like, right now. Oh, just pause it. Pause it is good. <laughs> no, stop it. Stop listening. You don't want to have a video half-loaded in your tabs. That's going to slow down your computer immensely. James, uh, don't tell the listeners not to listen to us. No. <laughs> Nothing is slowing down. Uh, uh, but anywho, James, where uh, do we start? Oh my with this god, one? we are back to nine to the nineties where my Walkman is running out of batteries. <laughs> um, <laughs> we start these reviews with, of course, the very first issue, the issue number one of the MLP comics, the regular series, the return of Queen Chrysalis, and we're going to do this so we're going to do this so we review the entire arc. So we're going to be reviewing seri uh, issues from number one to number four. Uh, which were released between 2012 and 2013, uh, and with art made by An uh, Andy Price and script written by Katie Cook. Okay, yes, so uh, where should we start with this one, guys? Um, should we give like a backstory of what happened in the previous? Uh, because this uh, this comic leads directly from the TV show. Well, to a degree. I mean, it, it ties into the, the fallout of a Canterlot wedding and literal fallout as the changelings fall out of the sky. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and, uh, they they somehow come back uh, in a, shall we say, rather disturbing first issue where the entire town of Ponyville gets invaded by pot ponies. Wow, there's a reference somewhere I'm missing because pot ponies, like pot people, what show was that yeah. again? That the was of the body snatchers. Oh, exactly. Most particularly the one with uh, Donald Sutherland. In fact, I think they have the they had a pony who pointed and shrieked just like the yeah. movie. <laughs> yeah, that is a Donald Sutherland scre screeching pony in, in in the issue. That's brilliant, shall we say? Yep, yep. And, that, and that's the one thing that you're going to notice with this comic is, and, and with all the comics uh, in this series, is that it, it's full of eye candy. Mm-hmm. It's full of detail. You can spend three minutes looking at just one panel, trying to figure out all the different references and notes and shout-outs that this, this series is given. Oh, yeah. I have to say this. Like, for my experience going through the comics, like, issue number one, I got no idea what I was expecting because comics, their fan-made comics are out there. And some of them made extremely quick and funny some of them have epic stories to tell and for example your silver yours is a pretty good story about this one oc who was just basically hanging around with the main six that is also a good story there so what can we expect from the comics now because well besides good art what can we expect from the story and reading through issue number one wow 
I did not saw that coming. I uh, I, I enjoyed the, the first issue. Felt like the show in a lot of good ways. I mean, every, it's harder when obviously the characters can't move, but they still convey Pinky's goofiness, Fluttershy's sweetness and timidity until she gets so mad that she talks down a uh, changeling. <laughs> oh yeah. And I think right then the changeling would like to turn into a rock and hide under itself. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there is the the fan. The first issue was also the moment fans started to ask, "Is this in continuity?" Oh yeah, yeah. Because, is this canon? Because they they did one thing to kind of shoot themselves in the foot. Oh, what was it? When they said that it, that the changeling impersonators have a dead giveaway in that their eyes glow green. Mm-hmm. Now, you watch A Candlelight Wedding, yes, indeed, Chrysalis, as Cadence, her eyes turn green in one scene during the This Day Aria. Mm-hmm. But she was doing that in an empty room, singing to herself, and of course no one hears because, you know, it's non-diegetic. It did also happen when right before Cadence, uh, fake Cadence sent Twilight down into hell, when her eyes glow green for a moment. For a moment. And not only so, that, sorry, um, not only that, during the three ponies, like Lyra Colgate and whoever was there, was trying to stop um, Twilight and Cadence. And I think Twa- Cadence threw a bouquet of flowers, or something like that, and those three chased after it. Those three ponies' eyes were glowing green. Yeah, but you know, when the when there is the fight scene, the main six versus all the changelings, the eyes of the changelings that, that the changelings that were turning to the main six, they are not glowing green. I can totally understand what Silver, what Silver is saying here, mm-hmm. in that uh, that is definitely a weird decision that their eyes are green, <laughs> thus making them easier to be identified. Mm. But I think we're overanalyzing. <laughs> oh, really. so, well, this is this is what starts fans questioning. I mean, when you it's the double-edged sword of trying to tie in with the show's continuity. Oh, that, that is true. That is true. Then so, again, yeah. uh, to to bring back what uh, what we were talking about before the the recording started, mm-hmm. at one point Katie and Andy they were being interviewed. I think it was during Babscon actually, and they were asked, uh, "What's the continuity refer? Uh, con, con, like, how is the comic stuff canon compared to the show stuff?" And they said that whatever happens in the comics is second tier canon. And whatever happens in the show is first-tier canon. If you take notice, in future uh, issues of the comics, they make reference to Equestria Girls, when in the show they have never made references to Equestria Girls. So if we were... This is how I take it. If we were to take the comics as alternate universe, the comics take place within the same continuity as Equestria Girls and not the actual TV show. Hmm. Well, the show has featured Flash Century twice now, so (laughs) what are you going to (laughs) do? That is true. That is true. Truth be told, Equestria the Girls had zero impact on the overall storyline, so... Yeah, definitely. There was mm. no there was no changes within the the world of the of the regular series compared to what happened in the movie, so... Mm, that'd be true, that'd be true. But um, I think we're moving away from what we really want to talk about, which is... Yeah, the comic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. This but, is what happens when we have a professional brony analyst on our side. Ay, ay, ay. Focus? What's that? Yeah, what's that? That's fine, that's fine. There's a lot of people that have made a career of not keeping focus. Look at Alain DeGeneres. Oh, no, no, no. Um, look at look at Final Fantasy XIII. Ah, God, no, shut up. <laughs> yeah. uh, don't, 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 Norman, don't do that. Okay. <laughs> but no, yeah, um... What this issue does, I think what it does very well, is that it keeps itself, when we were just joking about focus, it keeps itself well focused even though it has a lot of genres. Like it's an mm-hmm. adventure comic, it's a, it's a horror comic, it's a comedy, it's a fantasy, it's, it, it kind of has the, the, the conflict that Twilight has towards the end of the last issue. It has all those elements and it handles them very well. And, there is not that much of a uh, jarring contrast when it comes to, to balancing them. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, the, the eye thing is really the only gripe, you know, and that just is to get the ball rolling. Mm. Oh, There's nothing, it, it does not break the, the comic or ruin it. You just like, you just scratch your head for half a second. 
Yeah, mm. the the other the other thing that kind of like seemed weird to me was that uh, the the balance when it comes when it comes to storytelling in that the first three issues there is a lot of adventure, there is a lot of action, there is a lot of thrills and all that. You have the main six separated and coming back together. Then they reach Chrysalis's castle in the the ruins of Wooby Dooby Valley, which <laughs> by the way that is the real name, uh, according to Andy and Katie. Oh god. And uh, and there is sudden dump, exposition dump, right on your face, where Crystalis and Twilight have this very lengthy conversation about the Secretariat com- the Comet coming down and the energy search and the magic search and all that. And I was like, this is interesting, but it's heavy, and I don't know if, like, either the target audience or even us will be able to uh, uh, thread through this. Like, if you know what I mean. Like, all of a sudden, bam, a lot of dialogue. Mm-hmm. When the other three issues haven't been very dialogue heavy. But I think it's the whole setup of the first book where you need to establish yourself as a legitimate comic because, like I said before, the fandom has already done a huge amount of comics and most of them are really well done and most of them are for free. So here and now, why should I pay for something that is already free online? Obviously, to say that they did a good job with what they had and what they are doing. Well, because it's official and mm. it's very badass. Mm? True, 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 true. Um, I, the art for once here, I, I do enjoy it. Like, in... The last, or in the first few pages of the, no, the last pages of the book where um, Rarity was asking, how do we know that that's really them? And we can see Applejack's face. That face, it's priceless. Eddie priceless? No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, the, the artwork is, is really striking. Like, on the first issue, I don't know if you noticed, but the issue... The first issue of the MLP Comics is uh, labeled uh, 7 plus on Comixology. It's not uh, like uh, for all audiences. It's not PG, it's 7 plus. Oh my. And it makes me wonder why. And that's because the artwork is so striking and actually very dark as well. The first time that we see Queen Chrysalis through that glowing orb, that is terrifying. Oh. Yeah, it's like. Yeah. yeah, she looks like a. She looks. She reminded me of the evil queen from. Uh, from Snow White. Mm-hmm. She has a striking presence. Mm. Although, uh, Chrysalis is actually the strongest point of that arc. Mm. She uh, is. The, w- the way she can alternate between threatening villain and much put upon just suffering the Crusaders' <laughs> own randomness. Oh, yeah. Uh, but, you know, the, if, if you do take these comments in with the show, just think that while well, Keaton's and Shining Armor are dancing at their wedding and everyone's so happy, an entire town of adorable creatures is being wiped out and drained of love. <laughs> For kids. Uh, yeah. It's a yeah. family movie. That's cold. That is really cold. Yeah. Um, yeah, so Kate, Twilight and Company save the day. The villain gets trapped in stone and the world is saved. Keaton's and Shining Armor save the day. They shift the tragedy to the next town over. <laughs> Uh, I'm deconstructing everything happy about a Ken or Lock wedding. <laughs> no, that is, that, is, that is perfectly fine because, to be perfectly honest, I didn't enjoy those episodes at all. So, hey. To me, they had way too many... They, they played too many cliches, too straight, and they played it way too safe. Hmm. Like, the only, good thing about, the only good thing about those episodes to me is the villain. Mm-hmm. Uh, but in the same way that you said that the villain is the strongest point, it is true. It is the strongest point of this comic because she is the biggest source of horror and the biggest source of comedy. Mm. Like, she's able to look incredibly threatening. Like, when they are killing the... They are, they are literally killing, okay? The creatures from... The, the uh, little kitties and rabbits from Wooby Dooby Valley and they are draining them of love, or they are, like, smashing their heads against the wall. They <laughs> smash the head, the head of one of the creatures against the wall. You hear oh. the thud, followed by a splotch of black Ink. something. Oh, and, and it's... Turns out uh, it's just raspberry jam. <laughs> it was raspberry jam. Mm-hmm. Somebody but... spilled an ink, a, 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 an ink bottle on the, on the wall. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's, like, the way that... Uh, but then you have Chrysalis uh, with her... 
outrageously hilarious facial expressions. Like, uh, she's been labeled by so many people in the fandom as Queen Backteeth. <laughs> oh, that's not nice. That, but that's that's true because she has those crooked, uh, uh, sharp fangs that are like absolutely hilarious. Hmm. I call her Queen Swiss cheese. <laughs> oh boy! <laughs> because of the legs, right? Oh my! It's always the legs. And that and her evil plan did have a lot of holes to it. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> uh, but anywho, she, she was the first one to be surprised to see that everything turned out well. She, oh my god! I cannot believe you guys are so stupid. <laughs> Stop uh, it! You're <laughs> so stupid! Uh, UHF, love the movie. But anywho, gent, uh, I think we're kind of sidetracking here. And um, James, what's the first uh, kind of short synopsis for the first issue? Well, in that, okay, the first, uh, well, the first star goes goes as follows. That is, uh, there is a comet coming on that is called the Secretariat Comet, and it's going to pass right over Equestria. This is going to cause a magic surge. And because of this, Queen Chrysalis, who has found exile in the land of Wooby Dooby Valley, which is where she got banished after the events of a Cantalorat wedding, she wants to lure Twilight Sparkle into that place, not to drain her of her love, but to drain her of her magic, right during this magic surge. Now, there is no easy way to make Twilight Sparkle get there unless it's for a very good reason. So, in order to do that, Chrysalis kidnaps the, C- the CMC and uh, sends the, the main six uh, ultimatum saying, if you, don't come, if you don't come here, I'm going to do some terrible things to them. Uh, so, the main six take on the journey to go to where Chrysalis is staying right now. Through there, they're going to be separated, reunited, they're going to find... Uh, caves full of trolls that collect Hasbro products, <laughs> uh, spiders that wear bowler hats, uh, living plants, uh, uh, creatures that eat goats, and many other uh, monsters that can only live in the world of Equestria. Finally, they will reach the castle where Chrysalis is awaiting for them, and after facing the dreadful Inception Escher uh, labyrinth, they get there and they fight Chrysalis to recover the CMCs and get a happy ending. That's Yay. basically the skinny of it. Also, I forgot to mention that they're going to be facing almost like 80% references to movies, horror movies, and adventure movies. From Temple of Doom to It to The Shining to The Evil Dead to The Creature from the Black Lagoon. Oh. So, yeah. And yet none of these horrors is quite as terrifying as telling Pinky you don't want to eat a cake. <laughs> yeah, you don't want to do that. You don't want to do that. Which we also see Pinkamina in one of the issues, so... Oh, wow. Yeah. Yes, she deflated. Mm-hmm. She did, isn't, didn't that get kind of scary at this point? Like, oh, no. It's kind of like a psychological uh, trigger where you see Pinky's main deflating and you're like, uh-oh, things are, okay, the crap just hit the fan. But that that has been always Pinky's MO, where if friends um, don't like her or... Yeah, if friends don't like her or say bad things about her, she gets all um, mean down or gets down and, you know, just gets all yeah, sad. Well, but anyway, we are definitely getting sidetracked. Okay, mm-hmm. let's start... Let's start... Uh, let's go... Backwards alphabetically. So, Silver, what did you like and what did you not did you not like of uh, this comic? Well, I do enjoy all the pop references. Uh, these, I think, the writers know who their audience really is, and so they and they play to that. I mean, the, you know, kids are not going to get half the references in these comics, and these comics actually seem to have permission to take on a darker tone which I actually enjoy, these, the change things aren't a menace unless you give it a darker tone. Weakest issue was issue number two, where the main six split up, because to engineer this breakup, they have them basically not questioning the situation. They hear their friends talking smack about them and just think, no one, no one stops to ask, hey, we're up against changelings. Could these be changelings? Until, thankfully, Rainbow Dash in issue three. But issue two felt so forced in breaking the group up, much like a Canterlot wedding, that uh, it's like, okay, that was a stumbling point. But thankfully, it's early on in the comic, uh, early on in the arc, so you can bounce back from that. 
that is something that I would have to agree with. The, for, the second issue, the moment where they split up the main six, it feels way too artificial. It, it, it's like, okay, you have to split up. Why? Because the script said so. Okay. Mm. Yeah, I, I have to agree too, because that part is easily solved by asking or just confronting um, whoever that said, like, did you bet one of me? Oh, what about you? And then, well, technically, you could just say, I did not say that. Yeah, but still, it's a bit too forced. Now, on the positive spectrum, uh, Twilight enhanced by the magic. I oh, yeah. she, she comes off as way more powerful than when she becomes an alicorn. Mm-hmm. An alicorn is a set of wings. This is magic literally radiating off of her. The, I like the, the the idea of the Secretariat comet. It did feel also kind of like out of nowhere because this is something that uh, uh, is like it came out of nowhere, but at the same time it it makes so much sense within the world of Equestria. Like, why wouldn't these uh, magical creatures be affected by the the moons and the stars? Is that it? That's the what you like and what you don't like. Um, at least for for this arc. In general overview, yeah. I mean, there's always little jokes and uh, bits of silliness, but those are the, like the big standout moments. Mm-hmm. <laughs> what about you, Norman? I have to agree with Silver. During issue two, when they had to split up, th- that was a bit, like he said, forced. And yeah, I, I remember reading the when for the first time reading that issue, I was thinking to myself, "Oh, why did they no mm, stop stop that ah." And like they say, it was forced. I, I couldn't put it in better words because I'm not that smart. But still, to me, it felt so forced and they could do it better. But you know, they had to create conflict. And for the first um, for the first time or for the first arc, I didn't mind it. It fits well. Well, then again, you know, you're just saying that it creates conflict, it, it does all that. You know, the one thing that they could have done, uh, this is, I, I don't like doing this, but just throwing it as a random idea, uh, because this is like reviewing the comic that we didn't read, it's reviewing the comic that we would like to read. But mm-hmm. another way around this kind of issue is that if you don't want to create that kind of conflict, you can separate them in the caves and make them go different ways so they get out of the caves in three different exits. But that's the thing. Um, why would they split and up? They, if you don't give them a reason to split up, they won't split up. Because, well, well the, they... Oh, sorry, go on, go on. I, I think we're going to have the same answer that uh, they did give them a reason to split up in that there was a cave in. Yeah. And so, they were they were forced into three groups. The only... The resolution of that being that all three paths merged at one point. If you just take away that, that uh, return path, you can keep them separate and not, and still, the plot wouldn't change all that much. Yeah, because the reunion in issue three happens as sudden as the split up in issue two. Like mm. for a moment, for a moment, I thought they were not going to split up, reaching the end of the cave, and I thought, oh, maybe fighting the spiders at the end will uh, bring them back together. Yeah, yeah, we'll bring them back together. But no, they they leave the cave after fighting the spiders, and they're like, no, we still hate you. We're going to go our way. And by the way, I'm taking the map with me, so screw you guys. I'm <laughs> going home. And I'm like, what? what? Uh, okay, wh- whatever. We'll wait for issue number three. Let's see how you resolve this, Princess Twilight. Yeah, but I do think that um, the whole scenario where the split up happened and them fighting with the big giant spider, in in any other story, that would be the part where, uh, let's kiss and make up. Nope, they had to go through one more issue for them to discover that how silly they were being. And for that, I kind of pay respect to that because the show is all about friendship. And if you don't give them a... Uh, if you don't show them or show the audience, like, this is what will happen if you don't be good friends with your friends. Like, certain things like people... I'm um, talking bad about you behind your back. Those are just nothing, just words. If you take them too seriously, you're going to end up with what happened to them. Hmm. I think you know where you're coming from, but still, it could have been handled better. Yeah, true that. Yes, but yes, just my, just my opinion. True that, but what we are given, 
we just have to take it. No, of course. And personally, I think this is the great, uh, the best way you can start a a comic series. Okay, let, let's let's think about this for a second. Okay, this is where I uh, where I really like uh, what I really like about these these four issues is that this is My Little Pony, mm-hmm. and they start the issue. The, the comics, the, the official comics. Number one, what do we have first? We have a shout out to the invasion of the body snatchers, mm-hmm. followed by a comic that, uh, followed by uh, issue two, which has a, a, a giant troll that likes to collect uh, toys of Optimus Prime and likes to style the ponies' heads and manes and all that. That's that's absolutely hilarious. It has a map which. I should bring attention to the map because the names that are on that map, that they're also outrageously funny. <laughs> and issue number three is, again, same amount of both action, but a lot of imagination. It's very creative. It's very colorful. And it, 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 it flows great. And it adds a little bit of mythology to the, to the TV show. But that you can either take it or leave it. It doesn't force you to like accept it. It's like it's there. You can do whatever you want with it. Accept it or leave it. And it's like cool. Thank you. Mm-hmm. So it it feels it it doesn't feel forceful. It doesn't have a, a lot of pop culture references that are going to be dated. All the if you realize there is no reference to like there is no Twitter bird. There is no reference to Facebook. There is no references to to things that are going to be a fad and that are going to be forgotten. They are all classical references, like Indiana Jones, like Invasion of the Body Snatchers, like uh, the Escher drawings, like uh, Stephen King novels. Like th- th- those are going to be timeless. Those are going to be there forever. It's not. It 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 feels like the like the regular series, without. Uh, without the shortcomings of let's let's try and keep this safe, they like they can take risks. Mm-hmm. That is true. That is true. The, mm. I I think they went over when they technically wrote the book and draw it because sorry, in the first page we saw the CMCs getting attacked by God knows what. So yeah, that they was get attacked awesome. by us. They get attacked by a swarm of possessed animals. Yeah, that's the thing. That that was, but they don't. They didn't show it. They didn't show it. But still, that was scary. So it is. It is very intense for little kids, and mm-hmm. it's. It is very entertaining for for grown ups. Mm-hmm. It's something that you don't. You don't feel like. Oh, I'm. Uh, yeah, I'm watching. I'm reading the MLP comic. This mm-hmm. is so cool. It's so entertaining. You should read it. And actually, I have met a couple of guys that. that they got into the into into the show thanks to the comic, and they said, "Dude, if the comic if the, if the show was as bad as the comic," and I'm like, "Well, it is bad as on its own right." And they're like, "Yeah, but oh, if it was as bad as the as the comic," and I'm like, "Fine, fine, mm-hmm. but, but it James, is great on its own right." But James, what about you? We we forgot to ask you. What do you think? No, this is this is precisely what I think. Everything that he just said is exactly what I think of the of. of of these first four issues is that the only shortcomings come at the end when they dump all of that conflict that Twilight says. I don't want to. I don't want you guys to die. I will stay here and be consumed by chrysalis. And mm. that takes for like three three pages when it all could have been resolved into one. But yeah. that's my one and only gripe with the with the comic. The, the separation thing. I can understand how that can be a deal breaker for many people. But it it wasn't a deal breaker for me. It's mm. uh, it didn't detract from my enjoyment. And you know what? I think it didn't re- det- detract a lot from the enjoyment of of anyone anyone else. I don't know. Was was it that much of a deal breaker for you guys? Uh, uh, the split up. Oh, it wasn't a deal breaker for me. I but I said uh, I said oh that that was an awkward note to end the second issue on. But hey. Next month, I get to see them come back together. So mm-hmm. I think I think that's part of it. There, there may be a good lesson there, but because you know they're going to get back together anyway, mm-hmm. <laughs> it feel it just feels more forced because of it. Mm, that, that is true. That is true. And, and as for me, I I do like it, and that didn't detract that detract me from liking the comic. It did. How do I put this? I forgave it because, or I give it leeway because it was their first foray into the books or into the comic world. And you know what? I had fun reading it and I can't wait to see what they come next in issue number five. And issue number five is, it it ain't no slouch. That's all I can say. This being the first, the very first arc 
is that it, it, it is a very basic story. It doesn't uh, it did take risks, but it wasn't as risky. If you want to take risks, read the second arc. Mm-hmm. That, that is issues from issue five to issue eight. That I didn't expect the many things that they did with that comic. Yeah, that was surprising. True that, true that. But James, for the first foray into the comic world, I say, um, I say the first arc. It did a good job to introducing the fandom to what they are, what they have, and what they can do. Because if you think about it, people didn't really like the first book just because of certain parts. I remember Dan telling me that he didn't like it. Oh, you're talking about the the Crystal Heart spell. No, no, no. I'm talking about the comic book. Like, um, really? Yeah, he didn't because like I, it. Because I, I thought that the actually, you know what? I think that is only Dan's case because if you go to Comicsology, you can check the ratings for that comic. Issue number one has like over 800 ratings, mm-hmm. and that has it has a score of like I think 4.5 stars out four and a half stars out of five, mm-hmm. which is True, very much unheard of. It also became the best selling. First issue uh, for a new series, and uh, it, it sold over one million uh, copies. Pre-orders. Pre-orders, yeah, right? mm. yeah, no, and, and and copies as well. It's oh. like it broke records. Yeah. That issue broke records. So it's like if that doesn't like it, well, that's fine. It's his opinion, but mm. he True. kind of has the entirety of a big majority of the fandom kind of like going against him. Yeah, but you have to remember he's hypercritical, which is something that I try not to be. Yeah, yeah, that is true. That is true. I think I, I. I hope I succeed. Sometimes I think I don't. <laughs> it's okay, man. It's okay, man. So, what else can we talk about this amazing comic? Personally, I think we should go to final verdicts on mm. how it was and uh, and the impact that it has left. Because uh, this is kind of a big deal. Do you guys remember the original comics that were released for Generation One? No, I'm, I'm honestly saying no. <laughs> were they? Oh yeah, they were. Have you ever seen those, Silver? Not not for G one. I, I back at, back in the day. I was still focused on Transformers and be horrified at how they keep killing Optimus Prime in those things. <laughs> <laughs> well, in the well, the original MLP comics, the official ones, had the same amount of quality as the the comics that you may find on the on the magazines. You mean the magazines as in the magazines? The pony mag- magazines, you know, <sighs> the comics made with the comics made with all those vectors, oh, with God. the weird poses and the weird legs and the silly storylines that they are all about baking cakes and uh, and losing uh, laces and all that and all that. Well, those were the the original official uh, comics. So going from that to this. It's a big step forward. It was a big leap of faith. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, and uh, Hasbro was taking a big risk. It could either break or, or make uh, a new market. And thank God that it did make it because, wow. Mm-hmm. Oh, one thing we forget to mention that um, if, even though um, the story in the comic is tier 2 canon, Hasbro still needs to okay them before publishing it. So Hasbro has the um, last words to the comics. Yeah, and that says a lot mm-hmm. because it will make you it will make you scratch your head saying how could they approve that? I we will know more about that in the in the next issues, of course. But we are not going to talk about those now. Oh, true that, true that. Consider this a very the very first episode of a new series, so we are kind of like inexperienced talking about the comic. Yeah. Uh, so. If it feels un, unbalanced or like kind of out of place, that's because we're kind of new to it. This is the first time we all do something like this, right? Mm-hmm, With mm-hmm. a comic. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but but no matter what your medium, the st- the structure of characters, uh, conflict setting, uh, themes, all that stuff is pretty universal. So if you can hit those notes right, you got yourself a good story, and that's what that's what at the end of the day we all want. True that. True that. Yeah, and, and in the end, this 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 arc did hear it. I mean, I don't know if you guys we we never never touch upon this, but I think none of the characters was out of character. Oh, like no. all the all the characters sounded the way they should. Fluttershy sounded like Fluttershy. Rarity sounded like Rarity. They had their personalities. There was there 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 was no betrayal to speak about. Mm, true, true. I felt at home with the characters. Like 
what uh, me reading the first issue again, just looking at Pinky's randomness and reading her lines, it's believable. And Rarity's um, fav- my favorite phrase for Rarity is that escalated quickly and ended abruptly. That just made me giggle just because of Ron Burgundy. Although there were moments where something new was added to the character. It's not necessarily, it, not a betrayal of the character, but something I take that you thought you'd scratch it and like, yeah, I could see them doing that. Hmm. In case in point, Fluttershy watching the uh, jackalopes and chupacabras yes. duking <laughs> it out for the right to yeah. eat them. And while everyone else has these horrified, disgusted, and near sick looks, Fluttershy is just taking this all in stride. <laughs> Nature giving is so the, fascinating. <laughs> giving rise to any number of memes. Yeah, though it is, it, but that is really in character because if you think about it, Fluttershy has always been next to a forest full of horrible creatures. She's used to that kind of stuff. She's, a care, she's an animal caretaker. She must have seen some horrible things in the past. So she's used to it. Well, I, I, I agree with you. I just, uh, I think, well, the show never really put that forth. But yeah, I can totally see her being like that. Yeah. <laughs> but this opens up a whole new um, hit canon or whole new perspective on Fluttershy. Because in the show, we see Fluttershy taking care of the animals, no matter how big or small it is, even uh, putting a mouse on a wheelchair and stuff. And... To that point, like, oh, it's done for comedic effect, but it also says that huh, Fluttershy really cares about the animal and don't want to see them get hurt. And well, in that, Fluttershy will, will, is smart enough that she will be able to discern when she can help and when she has to step back. And I think that she is smart enough that she actually gives a very good explanation saying, this is the moment where they have to fight for the territorial uh, control of this, of this land or whatever. So she knows that she doesn't have to meddle. Hmm. Or else she's going to she's going to get mauled. Oh, so, true that. True that. Yeah, that is that is actually there is no head cannon effect right there. That is just the logic of the show, uh, showing in all of, in all its glory. Well, I wanted to continue on with the comic, but uh, you you shut me down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just I I want to avoid as uh, over over anal- uh, over analysis as possible. Let's. Mm. And let's try and see things from a more uh, simple, innocent point of view. Like, th- let's not go crazy. It- it's fun to go crazy, but not when we go too too far. Yeah. So, final verdict. Guys, what do you think? I greatly enjoyed the first arc. I thought it was a, a fine start off to the piece and uh, really showed a different tone of storytelling, but was that wasn't in conflict with the show, but had its own unique identity at the same time. Uh, you know, second issue, like I say, had a tripping point. There are minor nitpicks, but truth be told, nothing so severe that it took me out of the story. And so, greatly enjoyed it. I, I, can, I couldn't have said it better myself. Same with me. I I thought it was a very solid story, uh, very self-contained, made references to the show where it needed to, but it, it built on its own and expanded upon the world of Equestria, the 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 writer and the uh, and the artist like Andy and Katie they they took advantage of this very imaginative land and they exploited it for both visual and narrative content and they did a very good use of it kept the characters in character gave a very good villain uh, uh, gave her a lot of personality and explained events that took place in the show but we, that we didn't see so. Yeah, really, really, really enjoy this this issue, this this car, this comic arc. And as for me, like like I said before, this is a amazing run at the comic. Like their first attempt at doing a comic, I enjoy every moment of it. Even with the splitting up section, that entertained me a lot. And the pop culture reference with the diamond dogs and Ziggy and Stardust, <laughs> that. If you got no idea, over your head. So that's it for uh, the review of My Little Pony Friendship is Magic issues 1, 2, 4, uh, The Return of Queen Chrysalis. Join us next time when we tackle on issues 5 to, four, to 8, which is the Nightmare Return arc. What's going to happen on that one? What's going to be at the end? Only you know. And remember to check the uh, Comixology app and the website 
to get your MLP comics. Seriously, guys, the prices mm -hmm. are super dr super low, and they release them for free every now and then. Mm -hmm. You are not you you are missing on something big. Mm, true so, that, true that. This has been James Cork, and I am Norman Sanzo, and I'm Silver Quill. And we'll see you guys next time. Have a good one, everybody. Have Adios. Fun.